welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Anybody interested in the word tonight? Okay, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to read to you tonight. Now I'm going to read to you tonight. You say, I I thought you were going to teach. No, I'm going to read to you and then I'm going to talk to you about what we're reading. That's all. Just as simple as that. And it's just so cool. You're going to love it. So it's something different. No point one, no point two, no point three, point four, point five. If, you know, Pastor Dan's preaching, point seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. <laughs> and no, I'm only kidding. Uh, uh, so here, here it is. We're just going to have a great time talking about Jesus. Is that all right? Amen. I think you're going to love it. I think it's going to be great. And uh, actually, this is kind of the fun way for you to read your Bible. I'll show you how. Is that okay? I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Would you uh, stand to your feet and let's present our hearts to the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We are a very grateful people tonight as we boldly become uh, before the throne of grace and we make our petitions known. Lord, we want you to know that we are grateful and we're thankful and we're happy and we love Jesus and we're just grateful for what you have done in our hearts and our lives. As you bless us tonight, I want you to know, Lord, that we haven't come to hear from a man. No, no, we haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from an old man, young man, tall man, short man, black man, white man, brown man. We haven't come to hear from anyone but the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. So here's our heart, Holy Spirit. Fill it with your way, your will, your want, your desire. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Now, Lord, bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary, Chapels, and Harvest, Oak Valley, and Oasis, and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. Thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist. We thank you, God, for the way. We thank you, Father, for San Bernardino Temple our Adventist brothers and sisters, the Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but Lord, we actually want you to know that we are just co-laborers building the kingdom of God with them, and we thank you, Father, that the only kingdom that's being built is not a man's, but God's, and we'll give you the praise, give you all the glory, give you all the honor, Jesus' mighty name with a great, big, wonderful, loud shout. Everybody say amen. Man, you guys are ready to go. Take your seat, get your Bible, go with me to John 13th chapter here as we read the story of the Last Supper, which is taking place right before Easter anyway. It's a perfect time for us to evaluate the Word of God. Some amazing truths are in the Word of the Lord. Sometimes... Let me say, I want you to hear this. Sometimes we'll read the scripture and for what it is saying, we can understand it. It's kind of the superficial understanding that oftentimes we miss. There are things that are underneath the obvious. Sometimes we just zero in on the obvious when God is saying a whole lot more by just looking at the scripture. By the way, all the scripture has to line up, has to tie together and has to be truth. So when you're looking at the word of the Lord and you see something in the scripture as you're reading it and it's not so obvious but a mm, man a thought comes in, you better make sure that thought lines up with the word of the Lord. It's got to be truth. It cannot be an error and it cannot be a lie. Are you following me? So we look at the word of the Lord, some tremendous insight as we look at the Last Supper and as we look at this time of understanding. And let's just see what the Word of God has for us tonight. I'm going to read chapter 13, John, starting in verse number 1. And then I'm going to stop. We're going to look at some areas. Then we're going to keep on going. Is that okay? Uh, Here it is. John 13, verse number 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father. 
having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love these words when you look at them in verse number one. When Jesus knew. Let me tell you something about your Jesus. He knows everything. He knows the beginning from the end. When Jesus knew, you need to understand, he knows what's happening, what's going on. He knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. He understands what you're involved in. He understands everything. He knew the timing here. He understood it. He understood some great truth. Sometimes we approach the things of God as if God doesn't know. God knows everything. He knows where your heart's at. He knows what you're doing. He knows how broke you are, how much in wealth you are. He knows your attitude towards him. He understands everything. And when Jesus knew, sometimes we need to just circle the Bible and say Jesus knew something. And he knew something in this particular verse that's really fascinating. When Jesus knew that his hour had come, he knew the timing of the Father and the timing of the Son. Created the heavens, created the earth. Yes, he did. Created time itself. Time is not subject to Jesus. Let me tell you, excuse me, Jesus is not subject to time, but time is subject to Jesus. If time ruled Jesus, then there'd be a greater power, a greater force. But God has it all under control and Jesus knows everything from the beginning to the end, what's going on. What we don't know is we don't know the beginning from the end, but that's where confidence in Jesus comes in. Is anybody listening? He says these words, and his hour had come that he should depart from the world to the Father. There's an hour and a timing for each and every one of us. We're going to get out of here. Somewhere you're going. You're going somewhere. You're not allowed to stay forever on this planet. There's a time when you're going to either go to heaven or you are going to go to hell. And you and I need to understand, and this is so important for us to see, there's a timing for everything. And what you do with your time while you're here makes a statement about where you're going to end up. Jesus understood this. He said he went and he knew something, that he was, his time was up, he was going to depart from this world. It is the plan of God for every one of us to depart from this world. It ought to be. We make so much of an effort for our time here on the planet. We put so much energy into this life, but all of us in this room not only need to make an energy for this life, but we ought to express energy for that which is to come. And knowing there's a time coming when you will depart from this planet. No one has ever stayed. No one has lived forever except Jesus Christ. And when I tell you something, when you get off this planet and go to the Father, can I say something to you you need to hear? That's when real life begins. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. And we ought to be as smart as Jesus. We ought to be as smart as Jesus and be able to recognize and see that. The word of God goes on and it says, departs from this world unto the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. I love that. Jesus loved his own who were. Have you ever thought about who was his own? Have you ever thought about Jesus loved his own? I understand that. But who's his own? Is it his disciples that are with him? Might be. Is it the Jews that he came from? Might be. Is it those that have a heart for God? I don't know. Might be. But you know, there's one thing for sure that you need to know, and so do I, is that Jesus loved his own. Now, may I say this to you? You and I need to be a people who live our life knowing assuredly that there's a day coming when we're getting out of here. I don't know when it is. I don't know how long you've got on the earth, but there's a day coming that we will depart this planet just like verse one says, and we're gonna get out of here just like Jesus. And the question is, is whether or not we are going to love our own, listen to this, during that time that we're on the planet. And the same thing with Jesus is called for you and I. 
We're going to have to learn to love each other. We're going to have to learn to love people who bug us. We're going to have to learn to love people who hinder the things of God. We need to walk in love, express love, because what? Love, listen to this, never fails. And Jesus, who never failed, is in the heavens, departed, because in the next, in the part of that verse, says he loved his own. I believe it was his disciples. I believe it was his people, the Jewish people that he was there for. But I believe it was you. Everybody that has a heart for God, Jesus loves you. And I love what the next part of the verse says. Notice this at the end. It says, and he loved them to the end. Have you ever thought about what the end was? Was the end at the cross or was that the beginning? Is the end when time came up that they came and got him and he was no longer in earthly ministry or was that the beginning of an eternal ministry? He loved them. And to, can I just say this to you? With Jesus, there is no end. And he will love you today. He will love you tomorrow. Come on, somebody. He will love his own forever. He's there with you. You and I are departing from this place. We ought to spend some time thinking about what we ought to be doing to get out of here, go on to be with the Father, and love all of the people around us while we're here. Because guess what? Jesus makes a statement. He loved them to the end. And you know what? Love has no end. Is anybody listening? That's only verse number one. Which makes it a fascinating chapter. Verse number two, and supper being ended. The devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. Stop right there. When you read your Bible, there's an amazing statement here. The statement when summer was ended, the devil having already put into the heart, having already put into the heart, having already put into the heart. Let me say it again. Maybe you didn't get it. The devil having already put into the heart. The devil having already put into the heart. How in the world did it get in his heart? Have you ever thought about such a thing? The devil just comes along, he's stronger than you. Is the devil coming along, he can just put things inside of you? Are you the puppet for the devil? I don't think so. My Bible says greater is he that's in me, that's the Holy Spirit, than he that's in the world. So let me ask you a question. And how did he put it in to his heart to betray Jesus? Let me answer it for you. Words. He puts suggestions in your mind. He gets you to think about stuff over and over again. The more you think about it, the more it becomes part of you. When you think about it, instead of getting rid of it, if it's contrary to the ways of God, God says to get rid of it. But if it's not contrary to the ways of God and it is God, then hold on to it. But if something comes that's contrary to the ways of God, don't listen to those words. And oftentimes we don't realize how vulnerable we can be. That something is being dropped in our heart that really isn't the will of God. It isn't the plan of God. It isn't what God wants at all. It's just planted there and we think about it like watering a garden and it grows and like turning over the soil and it grows. And the more we give it attention, the more it grows until it becomes part of our life. Is anybody listening? It's so true. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, cast down imaginations that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God and bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. In other words, what I'm thinking is very important. Sometimes I can be in an argument with Deborah and I, I, I could just let myself play out. I role play what I'm going to say so that when the argument continues, I'm ready for the attack. 
Can I ask you a question? What if I didn't role play the ugly attack and I role played the word of God? In other words, would there be an attack? Would there be ugly words? Would there be unkind things said? Would I feel the way I do? You see, oftentimes, listen to this, listen to this. You feel the way you feel about something, not because it's real, but because you've heard it and meditated it long enough so it's become alive on the inside of you. And here's Judas Iscariot. There was a little thing on the inside of him probably that he saw about Jesus that kind of he wasn't quite sure about. And all of a sudden the devil starts to play it and he plays it more and more and he starts to listen to it. The Bible made it very clear. The devil put it into his heart and all of a sudden it became part of his being. Instead of getting rid of it, he played it with it. Listen, here's how it works. James tells us lust, listen to this, Entertain breeds sin. Sin breeds death. Sin doesn't just happen until you entertain it. And then once you've entertained it, you go from entertaining it to doing it. And then you keep doing it brings death. What if you never... Hear me now, are you watching me? Are you listening? What if you never entertain those kind of thoughts? What if instead of you saying, that person's a jerk, or I can't stand that person, look at that, that's the thing that bothers me the most about them, therefore I see this, and you keep building the worst about that person, won't be very long before you're out of love with them, won't be very long before you're mad at them, won't be very long before you cannot tolerate it, then you start making excuses where you're at, and instead of loving their own to the end, man, you've got all kinds of criticism. Do you remember the Bible, what it said? I I don't know if they can do this or not. In Genesis, the third chapter. In fact, if you've got your Bible, Genesis, the third chapter, watch this, verse four or five. Genesis three, four, five. I don't know if they can pop it up or not, but they probably pop it up faster than I can turn there. Genesis, the third chapter, verses three, four. Look at you, look at you. I'm, I'm racing you and you're already there. Genesis 3, it says, When the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. Let's back up just one more verse to verse number, uh, verse number 3. But the fruit here, in fact, let's back up to verse number 2. And the, uh, let's back up to verse number 1. <laughs> In Genesis 1, it says, And the serpent was more cunning than all the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Right there, she should have said, shut up. Now, don't tell me women can't say shut up. (laughs) Shut up. I'm not listening to you. I'm not going to think about what you're saying. It's contrary to the ways of God. She doesn't. Listen to this, verse, verse number two. And the woman said to the serpent, wait a minute, starts talking to this serpent. Do you know sometimes you have demonic thoughts about stuff and you start carrying on conversations with yourself about the demonic stuff? (laughs) Oh, you didn't get it at all and you're just quiet because you're thinking. Let me say it again. Did you know sometimes you have demonic thoughts about stuff and you inside you start carrying on conversations about the demonic stuff? And that's exactly what she's doing. In verse number two, and the woman said to the serpents, wait a minute, why didn't she say, shut up, get out of here? Right? We may eat of the fruit of the tree and of the garden, But the fruit of the tree in which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat, uh, nor shall you touch it, lest you shall die. And the verse number four, and the serpent said. Remember, and the serpent said. And the serpent said. And the serpent said. How many times do we hear something that's contrary to the word of God and we're hearing it in our thinking? Because he has already planted the thoughts 
in the heart of Judas Iscariot. Before he ever did it, the thoughts were there that brought about the sin that cost him his life. Is anybody listening? <laughs> See, what you think produces fruit shortly after you think about it. Oh, let's get down to reality. You're on the internet. Some pornography thing comes up and you go, I think, uh, I, oh, I'm not going to look at that. And then you go, uh, 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 um, well, I'll just look at it for a second, see what it is. And all of a sudden, your thinking has got you trapped and you can feel it. And it's exactly the same way. Her thinking has now got her trapped. Instead of her getting that out of her thinking, she entertains it. Remember, entertainment breeds sin. Sin breeds death. Every sin comes from you thinking about it before you do it. Judas Iscariot was no different than you and I. And Satan, devil, comes along and plants in his heart. Could have rejected it. Could have said, no, this is the Messiah. Get away from me, you foul thing. And he'd have been one of the great disciples. But he wasn't. He had a little attitude about things and he kept on doing the attitude. Listen to this. Let me keep on reading. I haven't even gotten to the verses I wanted to start with. And the woman said to the serpent, verse number two, you may eat of the fruit, verse number three. Uh, but, okay, verse number four. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows when that day that you eat uh, of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. All of a sudden, the words are planted. Now let's go back. Let me give you an illustration. Let's go back to verse number two of John 13th chapter. In John 13th chapter, we're just talking about Jesus tonight. Is that okay? We're just reading our Bible and talking about Jesus, kind of, kind of fun, verse number two. And it says, when supper being ended, the devil had already put in to the heart of Judas Iscariot. Let me tell you something. Your thought process is like a garden that produces the fruit of your future. Let me say it again. Your thought process is like a garden that produces the fruit of your future. And that's why God says, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bring, watch this, every thought under the obedience of Christ. If Judas Iscariot, when that stuff started to come into him, said, no way, this is the Messiah, he had not been the one even though scripture had to be fulfilled. But it's there as an example for all of us to see and learn and grow. Verse number two is pretty powerful because it was put in him to portray. Do you know that God knows who's with him and who isn't? I mean, it's not, a, it's not anything. Let's go to verse number three. Are you ready for verse number three? Yeah. My goodness sakes alive. How am I going to get through this chapter in 10 minutes? That ain't going to happen. <laughs> verse number three, Jesus knowing there we go again. You know, God knows everything. You can hide, you can close your bathroom door, you can do something in the dark, do whatever you want. You can cheat on your taxes, nobody will know. You can even get away with it, but you'll never get away with it with God. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough, tell you the truth. You'll never get away with it, God. The Bible says your sins will be shouted from the house, Doc. You might get away with it this week, but next week you're going to get caught. And surely God caught you. Now, the reason you don't get caught right, about, right away, because God's given you time out of his grace to repent and change. Jesus, knowing that the Father gave him all things unto his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God. Can I just say this to you? How in the world can you read a verse like that? There is no doubt he has confidence in who he is. He is not saying, I, 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 I wonder who I am. I wonder what I can do. I wonder if I really am 
the Son of God. He knows that all, I mean, he's got it all under control. And the problem with that is we don't believe oftentimes that he's got it all under control. Because if we believe that, we would live a different kind of a lifestyle. Are you listening to what it says? Jesus knowing that the Father had given him all things. Now, all of a sudden, out of the blue, the verse before that is talking about Judas Iscariot. The, the verse before that, he knows his time is coming. And then all of a sudden, here he's making a statement about his greatness, and he knows his greatness. And he says this about his greatness. He says, all of a sudden, in verse number three, here comes this amazing story. It says, given all things unto his hand, that he came from God and was going to God. Can I just say this about you? You came from God. And you're going to God. And Jesus says, I didn't say this, Jesus said, and I've given you the keys of the kingdom of God. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And what you loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Man, you're a king's kid. You know, when you know who you are, you never have to prove who you are. Don't give a flip who thinks about you one way or the other. You know, when I was a young preacher, I didn't know who I was. People come at me all the time, make statements that were hurtful statements. And I'd kind of take those statements and think about them a while, and they'd settle inside of me. And I had to finally get to the place of casting those statements down. But you know, after 30 some odd years of preaching the gospel and pastoring a great church like this, I really don't give a flip what people think. Whether you like me or don't like me doesn't make a bit of difference. I just want Jesus to love me and I want my Debbie to love me. I'm okay with that, you know? Now I hope you like me because I'm in love with you and will love you to the end because that's the call that God's got for every single one of us. But the bottom line in this thing is that when you know who you are, you don't have to play games about who you are. You don't have to try to prove who you are. You don't have to have a business card printed and you handing it out and people say apostolic, the most holy, reverend, the most potentate of potentates. <laughs> you don't have to do that. You just know who you are. Jesus, Jesus knew who he was, where he came from, and where he's going. That's a whole lot more than most people in the American churches. We need to know where we came from, where we're going, and we also need to know who we are in Christ Jesus. My Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. Some powerful understanding. Let's just go on. It's pretty, pretty cool. Now, I love the first word in verse number four, rose. I mean, you find Jesus, he's going to get up and do something. When he was laying down in the boat and there was a storm, he got up and did something. When he walked on the sea, man, he wasn't just floating around on the sea in an inner tube. He got up and did something. You'll find something about Jesus. He, he's always in a ro risen position. He's going to get up and do something. And what am I saying that for? Because every one of us in here got God living on the inside of us. We ought to be people that get up and make something happen. <laughs> Rose from the supper and laid aside his garments. Can I just make a statement about laying aside his garments? His garments are what he wore and what he had on and his cloaks and everything. Do you remember the robe that the centurion soldiers fought over at the Calvary cross? They threw their dice because, man, it was woven well. It showed who he was. It showed that he was a rabbi. It showed his position. It showed his authority. And he takes it all off to do something. Man, I want you to know something about Jesus. He takes everything off in order to serve. We ought to be the same way. Whatever it takes for us to serve, let's get out of ourselves, get out of who we are, get away from our own personal identity and get into the fact that we are servants of the Most High God to love people to the end. Is anybody listening? This is only the fourth verse. 
He rose from supper and he laid aside his garments. What an unselfish attitude. That which describes and gives him identity, he puts it aside to do the job. Every single one of us, if we're going to be like Jesus, you're going to have identity in this world. You're going to be doctors or painters or businessmen. You're going to be people of success, people that are educated, whatever it is your identity is. I want you to know something. Set aside your identity in order to do what God would have you to do. Jesus is setting aside. He took a towel and he girded himself. After that, verse number five, he poured water into a basin. Jesus is always pouring out water. Let me just say that again to you. Jesus is, oh, did you know that every day Jesus pours out water to you? The water is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus will always pour into you every day. As much as you want the Holy Spirit, you can have the Holy Spirit. There is always more of the Holy Spirit and Jesus doesn't pour it on the ground, but he pours it in a basin. That's just like our Jesus. He wants to pour into you and 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 he wants to pour into me. He doesn't want to pour pour it on the ground. He wants to pour it into a basin that'll hold the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. That's encouraging. And he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with towels in which he was girded. And he came to Simon, first number six, Peter. Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered. See, Jesus knew everything. He knows Simon Peter. Simon Peter's at that place in his life where he's got a big mouth. In fact, the very last, I think it's the last verse of this chapter, talks about where Jesus says to Simon Peter, Peter, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times, big mouth. Wait, the big mouth part was put in by me. And Peter's always got, I like Peter. I often talk, I think my Debbie's a female Peter. She just talks a lot. She likes to talk. I, and I want you to know something, I like it. Don't misunderstand me, I like it. So go tell her if you want, but I, I'm making it clear, I like it. So Peter comes along and he makes this statement. I love this. And Jesus answers and said to him, what I'm doing, you do not understand, verse number seven, now, but you will know this later. How many of you realize that what God's doing in your life today, oftentimes you don't understand what's going on? He's doing something that if you'll just hang in there with Jesus, You'll find out later on that what you are going through that's even seemed like great pressure, Jesus had it all under control and the fact that you went through it meant you are better off than you've ever been. But at the time, but at the time, Deborah and I were started a church called Los Angeles Christian Fellowship in West Los Angeles. Went home to where I grew up and Debbie grew up. She grew up in Santa Monica. We met at the Women's Club in our YMCA in, in Santa Monica, California, at San Monica Boulevard. I'll never forget the experience. It was an amazing experience. We lived in Redlands and we drove every Saturday night to Westwood. Westwood I don't know if what the population's like now, uh, but in those days, it was the highest Jewish population in the world outside of Jerusalem was Westwood. I thought that was fascinating. I went to school there, I lived there, uh, I, you know, I was raised there, and they have a bunch of movie theaters, and UCLA is right next to, to Westwood. And we'd go pass out tracks 
Every Saturday night, we drive there, and pass out tracts, and just inviting people to church on Sunday morning. I'm telling you, people would spit on us. They spit on Debbie. In those lines, those, those, you know, going to a movie or something, we'd pass out, we want to invite you to church. Oh, you kidding, throw it up and throw it at us and spit at us. Get out of here with that. Man, they were mean people. Every Sunday, we drove back to Santa Monica, Westwood area, went, set up all the chairs, set up all the music. No one ever showed up for three months. It was the worst time. And then on the way home from West Los Angeles, we would, on a Sunday afternoon, we would drive all the way back to Redlands, and the tears would run down our face because nobody showed up. And I, God told me to preach, and I preached to those empty chairs every single week. And Debbie was watching the kids, and our music ministers were were, who knows, they were trying to get somebody to come in the building, they were outside. The chairs were completely empty, completely empty, and God said, preach. Three months of that, three months of crying, three months of feeling, three months of hatred, three months of wondering, three months of just never going anywhere. It was the worst experience of my life. And yet it turned out to be the best time. I would not give up a moment of it. You know why? Because it's in that experience that helped me to appreciate you. When you walk in those doors and I see you, let me tell you something. You're like this great gift from God and I just am in love with you because guess what? I know what it's like not to have anybody to come to church. And the grace of God brings you here. And I appreciate it. So sometimes... Peter, you may not know now what I'm doing, but you will know. And for some of you today, you're in this quandrum of thoughts and feelings and expressions. You're wondering what in the world's going on. And God is speaking to you tonight and he's saying, hey, you don't know what's going on now, but you will. Come on, somebody. Oh, my, 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 my. I have a whole chapter to go. I'm finished. And the reason I'm finished is because we ran out of time. But I want you to know, oh man, the rest of it gets so good. So good. So read it for yourself and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Oh my, it's just so powerful. What Jesus is displaying at that Last Supper is not just humility. Because everybody says, what an act of humility. He says, you call me teacher and you call me Lord, but you see what I do, I wash your feet. And you should be doing the same thing. And can you imagine calling someone teacher and watch this, not just teacher, but Lord. Do you know what that means? You're in a higher and greater position than me. You're smarter, you have greater revelation, you have greater insight, you're better, you're more talented, you're more gifted, you're a better person on the earth than I am. You're Lord above me. And he says, and yet I still wash the feet because having humility without servanthood is no good at all. And we need to be humble servants. Now, let me tell you what that means real quick because, man, that's like five verses from now and I don't have time to go there with you. So I'm going to take this one little verse very important for us to get tonight. Here's what it means. That means sometimes you will feel like you have the goods on someone else. Let's be honest. Maybe you're better educated. Maybe you make more money. Maybe you're smarter. And you feel like you have the goods. And when you have the goods on someone else, that's the opportunity to take a humble position and become a servant to someone you think less of. And that's what Jesus did. And he showed us humility with servanthood. And every one of us in here at times, we like to hang around people that we feel good about. 
We feel better than them, bigger than them, smarter than them, more important than them, richer than them, wiser than them. And it's a pecking order. But Jesus breaks the pecking order when he, he is called the teacher and Lord, washes their feet. And when you and I humble ourselves and become a servant to those who are not as cool, not as great, not as strong or mighty or intelligent or rich or as you or educated as you, but when you become a humble servant to them, you are Christ-like. And with that thought, I'm going to conclude tonight. I wish I had more time, but that's just the way it is. We can pick it up at some other time. I kind of like doing it like this every now and then. If God spoke to you about something tonight, will you give him a great big praise of the Lord? Wow. <laughs> Powerful. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Hundreds of you have already left. What a shame. But all of you that are here, if you could stay put. Stay seated. Are you listening? Listening? Stay seated, because when you get up, you disturb all the people around you. So let's talk just for a moment. I want to make sure you're right with God. Someday you're going to depart from this place, just like the verse number one said tonight. You know, someday, and I want you to go to God who sent you here. And I want you right with God. You can't get to heaven because you're a nice person. You can't get to heaven because you think you're okay. You can't get to heaven because you know a few verses. You can't even get to heaven because you know who Jesus is. The devil knows who Jesus is, and he's not going to heaven. You can't get to heaven because your mom and dad told you you're a Christian. You can't get to heaven because you think you're good enough to make it. None of that's in the Bible. You can't get to heaven because you went to church as a kid, and you were baptized or christened or had, you know, your parents took you to some little christening. It doesn't work that way. The way you get to heaven is you, Jesus said it like this, John 3rd chapter, must be born again. And a lot of times people don't understand what that means. They just turn off when they hear the words born again because Hollywood has done a really, really, really good job of taking born again people and making them look like fools and idiots, radicals and fanatics, jerk roids. But that's not what he's talking about. You must be born again means this, that you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. That's what born again means. From the beginning of the Bible, listen to me now, to the end of the Bible, that's what God's after. All of your heart and all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Did you hear me? It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Now listen, listen, I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus speaking. He says, I'm coming again and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Oh my goodness. What did he really just say? People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Let me define for you what lukewarm is. Lukewarm, little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. Huh? Lukewarm. You know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Watch this. Lukewarm. God is something in your life. Oh, yeah. He's something, but he's not everything. And can I tell you the truth? The truth is in Scripture is this. Until you make him everything, he won't even be something. Bottom line, he's not there with everything else. He's got to be greater than anything. And you have to make him that way by giving him all of your heart and giving him all of your life. I, I emphasize the word give. Here's the reason why. Because he's not a thief to rob your heart and life. It's your heart and life. And what you do with it is your call and your choice. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do this. Uh-uh, not going to happen. It'll never happen that way. It's a free will choice that you have to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. That's what you have the ability to do or not do, and it tells you where you're going and what you're going to be like. 
And the question is for you tonight is, have you really given God all of your heart or given God all of your life? See, I already know you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here. You already celebrate Easter every year. You already know about Christmas every year. You know about the baby in the manger. You've sung the songs about the resurrection. You know everything about Easter Christmas. You know about Jesus, but that won't get you to heaven. It's about your heart. Are you listening? Are you listening? It's about your heart. You have to give God your heart. He won't steal it from you. He's not a thief. And that's why we're in the house of God tonight. And that first verse where Jesus knew that he came from God and he was going to God ought to be your commitment tonight. And the way you go to God is you must be born again. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Ah, oh, not gonna work. You're gonna have to get to heaven God's way. And then he tells us you must be born again which means you got to give God what you have that he wants is all of your heart and all of your life. So in a moment, you say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And you can put it right back down. By the raising of your hand, here's what you're saying. You're saying, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'll see your hand because he said, if you confess me where? Before men. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll confess you before my father is mine. I'll see your hand go up. And you can put it right back down. Simple as that. Just as simple as that. I'll see your hand go up. You put it right back down. Simple as that. You're making a public statement for Jesus. You say, well, Pastor Jim, wait a minute, hold on. If I raise my hand, man, I'm going to be embarrassed. People behind me will see me. People I came with will see me. People in front of me might see me. I, I'm going to feel weird and funny. Guess what? Let me tell you something. Don't let the devil plant that in your heart. Tell him to jump in the lake because you're not going there with him. Because listen to this. Isn't it stupid to stay out of heaven because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees? Oh my goodness. If you care more about people than God, then you shouldn't be in heaven. But I don't believe that's you. I believe tonight you're going to boldly raise your hand and get right with God put it right back down. Just let me see it and then let me put it right back down. It's that simple. If you're embarrassed, oh well, get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. And somebody needs to love you enough and respect you enough, honor you enough, tell you the truth. And tonight is your night of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? If you never made a wholehearted commitment to Jesus, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that have never given him all of your life, saying, Lord, here I am, I'm all yours. If you've never done that, tonight is your night. Or maybe you're one of those people that made a commitment at one time but never really followed through with all of your heart and life. It was just like Peter saying, I will never, in other words, a bunch of hot air, but you never really followed through. Well, today is your day of following through. Maybe you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure. Get ready to put your hand up. Make sure. I'm going to count to three. I've done my job. Now it's up to you, all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, in the foyer. Hey, even on the internet right now, if you're watching live stream, tonight is your night of salvation. All across this place, I'm going to count to three, pop my hands uh, together, and let's get right with God and then put it right back down after I see it. Here it is. One, two. Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, thank you, seven, eight, thank you, God bless you. There's eight, anybody else? There's nine back over here, God bless you. There's another one on this side, 10, thank you, one right next to you, 11, thank you, God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 11 wise people, anybody, anybody, what? From this side over, all the sinners sat on that side tonight, right? I mean, all, all you guys had, you, know, you were infiltrated with people who were right with God. But all these people are cool. 
Okay, stop messing with God. Who else needs to get their hand up in this section right here? I'm looking at you right now. Now, come on, stop messing with God. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 10 or 11 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, how about this section? Thank you, there's 12. Man, I'm telling you, this section's hot. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a dozen people who give them their heart to Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God. 12 wise people, I know there's 12 more of you that ought to be right with God, that you know that you get your hand up. Tonight is your night of salvation. Maybe you don't understand it now, but you will, just like the verse. You don't understand this now, Peter, but you will. And tonight, if you'll get out of your seat and walk down, you don't understand it, but you will. That's what you have to do is do your part. All 12 of you that raised your hand and the other 12 that didn't raise your hand, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get yourself a check with your neighbor, but check with your neighbor. I want you to get your stuff, get in the aisle, meet me right down here in front. No one leaves. Leaving is rude. We're in church. This is God's time with the Holy Spirit moving in this place. Nobody leave. So I want everybody that raised their hand, every single one of you, and I want everybody that didn't raise their hand, but you should have, you know better than that, just to sit there and try to avoid God. God knows where you're at. And you need to come and give them all of your heart, give them all of your life. And I want you now, let's stand and welcome the people as they come. You come right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on. I give you my soul. Come on. And I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Every moment I Give them a hand as they come. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give good God good well I not everybody responded like I'd hoped you would but you know that's okay but you do not get saved by raising your hand you get saved by inviting Jesus into your heart and giving him all of your heart and all of your life now here's my question if you think you're gonna serve him in that rough world and you can't even walk down a safe aisle it isn't gonna work and here's my word to you you don't know what it means now, but you will. So anybody that raised their hand but you didn't come, come back again. We love you. We're not criticizing you, not judging you. You come back and give God all of your heart, and give God all of your life, and then you walk that aisle for Jesus, and you'll never be the same. All of you in front, thank God you've come. This is Pastor Joel. He's going to pray with you. Just go right over there and follow him. Make a left turn and follow him right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't God good?